Hi guys, today we're going to talk about um, cutting in the world of fabric. Um, now you might be thinking, well, I know how to cut fabric. I have scissors. I've done it before. Um, but cutting within the industry or cutting fabric within the industry is very different from what we're used to. Um, it's not really done with scissors. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, other implements that uh, we're not really used to when we learn how to sew by ourselves um, or for educational purposes. So I thought I'd take a little bit of a spotlight and look at uh, cutting practices in the industry. So we're going to learn about what we do as designers to organize the cutting process, uh, how the fabric actually gets cut and some of the tools and machinery used. Uh, and that is constantly evolving with new technologies as well. So that's pretty interesting to keep abreast on and uh, be informed about. So let's begin. So, um, so we are used to cutting fabric with scissors. Of course, we all have fabric scissors and we, when we cut and sew our patterns at home, uh, we cut our patterns out of scissors. However, this method doesn't really scale up. So it's perfectly fine when we're doing one or a few garments at a time. But when we go into um, larger productions, even for samples, so sample runs are typically not that big, and sometimes for very small companies doing a very small sample run, they might be cut by scissors. But larger companies, even the sample runs, will need different methods, different techniques, different technologies to cut large amounts of fabric at once. So before anything is cut, a marker needs to be made. Now this is an image of what a marker looks like. We've talked a little bit about markers before when I did a fashion industry overview. And pretty much, um, so this is an example of one marker and we can see it is a strate strategic layout of all of our pattern pieces that are going to be cut from one fabric. So this would represent all of the different sizes. So we have uh, our smalls, our larges, our extra smalls, our mediums, uh, extra larges, uh, so on and so forth. All of those pattern pieces uh, that are needed for a particular fabric type, need to be cut out of a particular fabric type. Now, down here, it's showing us the ratio of each pattern. And we have extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. So everything is being cut equally. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this is actually a little bit um, unusual uh, because we typically do uh, our markers with different size ratios. This is because we will typically cut more middle sizes, um, so sizes that aren't on the extreme ends, um, than we will the extreme ones. So for example, if I was to sort of amend this in a way, so here we see extra small one, that means there's, you know, I can see an extra small uh, pattern uh, uh, and it's, it's one extra small. So here's actually, we can actually take a good look at um, our, our back pieces, um, letting us know how many of each size uh, will be cut. So when this is cut, we're going to get an equal number of extra smalls, we're going to get an equal number, number of larges, an equal number of mediums, an equal number of smalls, and an equal number of extra larges. And that is indicated down here by the ratio of the cut. So one, 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 one. We're all getting an equal number. However, like I said, there tend to be more people in the kind of average range of sizes, so sort of like small, medium, large, than there will be in our extra small and large. So a lot of times what we will do is we will duplicate uh, the sizes that need to be cut more. So in this instance, if I wanted to create more small, medium, and larges, I might up this ratio to an extra small one, small two. Oh, I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, try not to click, an extra small one, ex uh, small two, medium two, large two, extra large one. That means I will have two small patterns placed onto this marker. So I will get twice as many small um, garments as I will extra small, right? 
Um, and this can be varied depending on layers. So I can layer the fabric differently for different cuts and different marker runs. Um, because sometimes we want just a few more smalls and a few less. We don't want a, a complete double. So we might have to make extra markers playing around with the ratios every time. So here again is another picture of uh, a different type of marker done with a different pattern program. And there's a lot of different programs out there that create um, your marker programs. Now I wanted to show you a little bit because we have uh, Optitex um, that we use in FD25 and a little bit in FD13 has a marker program. However, I tried to log on to it today and it wasn't very happy about it. So I'm going to show you just how to start a marker and kind of get a little bit more familiar with the, the idea of a marker with a free marker program. Now it is not as good as Optitex, but at least for this um, uh, lesson, it is uh, good enough just to sort of give you a small idea of how these markers are created. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get uh, Optitex working and give you a nice demo on the real powerful uh, industry tool. Um, I don't even think this is free, but I'm using it on a free demo right now. Um, it's part of the Cameo is part of a, a sort of some more amateur home uh, a pattern software system. It uh, has another name called Wild Ginger or something, if you guys are interested in a, uh, a home pattern making system. Um, it's all right, I guess. So I'm going to run it in demo mode. Oh, fine, it's just telling me all the things that I can and can't do. And we're going to get started. Um, so this is the main software screen. And what I want to do is I want to go down um, to marker, which is somewhere. Marker layout, here we go, marker layout. And it's gonna start its marker layout program. And here we go, marker layout. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna create a marker. Okie dokie. So um, pretty much I need to name it and I would name it, you know, what fabric um, uh, I would have, I would have a, a season or uh, even sometimes the cuts or things. So, you know, name it appropriately. So let's say spring 2021, and let's say this is going to be a marker to cut f uh, the fabric, uh, that I have that is a cotton poplin color number one, two, three. Okay, so this is my marker for my cotton poplar that is color number one, two, three, and let's say that's a pink, just because it's, well, we usually come up with fun names, so pretty pink. That's more fun. Um, also, it helps when we have five different pinks in a collection, knowing which pink is which. Same with color number. Okay, so um, again, I'm creating this marker for a poplin for spring 2021 uh, in my colorway for one, two, three, pretty pink. Uh, pretty good name. Now it's gonna say show all active styles. Um, so I would have created patterns uh, for different garments that this would be in, and I could have loaded them up here. They have some demo patterns for me to just play around with because I haven't really made anything in this program. Uh, body type, these are for women. Uh, garment type, I can select what kinds of, of uh, garment types it is. So it's going to be a, uh, a skirt. Since we have that, so we've got a skirt. And season, it's going to be spring. Fantastic. And um, it's going to be asked for my different types of patterns. This would be how I, I saved it. Base would be the basic pattern I make, so the middle size from which I uh, grade or size all the other patterns. This could be all the size patterns, and this could be a specific uh, custom pattern created for an individual client based on their individual measurements. But we can just keep it right there for now. All right, so looking good. I have everything labeled the way I want to. Let's go to next. Oops, sorry. Um, I have to select one style, so let me add a style, and I can only, okay, I gotta select the pattern first, I guess. I'm gonna select this pattern because it's the only one they really have for me because spring doesn't really show up as anything. Um, so I'm gonna add this style. I did, I did, I selected it, I swear. 
Why is it being annoying? This one. I want this one. This one that you have here. Oh, what am I doing wrong? This. I've selected this pattern. I'll select all of these. Okay. Or maybe it's just asking for the actual pattern pieces. Probably. Let's see. Let's add that style. Fantastic. Okay, great. So it added all those pattern pieces. Um, uh, that makes sense too. So um, when I was asking for a style, so not all pattern pieces to a pattern. So I was just selecting this for that's the one garment, but not all of those pattern pieces might be cut out of this fabric. So I have to cut uh, or select every pattern piece individually. Uh, that will be used, so I could have had the option to select only the pieces that will be cut out of this and then put all the other pieces that would be cut out of a contrast fabric or another different fabric uh, onto another marker. Because remember, the markers only include pattern pieces that will be cut out of that one type of fabric. You can never have uh, two different two pattern pieces that will be cut out of two different fabrics on one marker. Uh, that is a, okay, great, fantastic. Uh, not really helpful. Uh, let's go to next and it's going to ask, um, let me just get connected back on here again, sorry. Uh, that's going to be important later because I'm going to go back on, just sorry. My internet's been spotty, I probably you guys too, I think everyone's just using the internet too much. Okay, so um, I want to first say what kind of fabric this is going to be. We have a few other, few options here, uh, the most basic options, so we have interfacing. Uh, you guys know what that is. It can also be called fusible, depending on the type of interfacing. So fusible is interfacing. It's just a specific type of interfacing. It's the kind that you can iron on um, uh, with the sort of glue that fuses to the fabric. We also have sew-on interfacing and you know other different ty types of interfacing. So yes, we if we, even with um, interfacing, we have to create markers um, with all the pattern pieces that would have an interfacing cut out of it. We have a lining option for all of our lining pattern pieces, and of course our self, which is the main fabric used. So let's just um, do it self, and it is giving me some sample um, uh, materials, or sample uh, uh, descriptions of my material. It's giving me my code, so I would have entered in different codes and different types for different materials that I'm going to be using with the um, collection beforehand and again since this is just a sort of demonstration it's already in there um my width it's already telling me my width so i'm going to go okay it's, it's 45 inches and it's giving me a max length to work with as well and the since fabric comes on bolts um the max length is is really determined by um a, how big your table is, um, that's the main uh, constraint, but two, kind of how many different layers that you want. So again, um, when we're used to layering fabric at home, we just do two layers. We fold fabric in half and then we cut it out because we really just need, you know, uh, as many as, uh, you know, two uh, uh, pieces of, of a pattern piece for what we're making at home. But when we do it in the industry, we may layer, 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 layer a hundred different times. And this will depend on how many uh, pieces we're creating um, and how, and then the length of um, how far we lay it out before we fold it back or cut it back to lay out flat um, is dependent on basically uh, what is going to work best with the marker in terms of fitting the pattern pieces on. Uh, and then, of course, just how big our, our cutting table is. Uh, so 17, 72 inches is, is pretty small, actually. It's, it's quite small. Um, but I'm going to leave it there. Again, we only really have one pattern to put on this marker right now, so it'll be more than enough. Uh, we want to know about the selvages. So um, I'm going to do about a half inch for each selvage. So we don't want to cut in the selvage. So they're going to put like a little blocked out area on the top and bottom of the fabric. Uh, because, of course, uh, uh, we don't want to cut into the selvage. We never include the selvage of the fabric within our, our cut pattern pieces. Now it's going to ask us how we're spreading out our fabric. We can do it flat, which is to um, lay out a layer of fabric, uh, to cut it, come back, lay it out. So um, this is spread out. It is uh, not um, folded like we would 
typically um, flat again so it's just a layer of fabric rolled out from the bolt and then we either cut or fold it at the end and then come back flat you have selvage at the top and the bottom folded is more of the traditional method where we would fold the fabric um, along the length grain and uh, meet the selvages uh, atop, at the top. So you have two layers of selvages at the top and then a folded uh, lengthwise grain fold at the bottom. Uh, two really relates uh, to knit fabrics that are uh, knitted within a, a tubular setup. So this is fabric that comes in a tube shape already. And uh, I'm actually not quite sure what this one is. So let's just pick flat. Um, Google it later, I'm sure there's answers. And then of course, striper plaid here, we might have some, a specific uh, uh, need or direction to note that, or if we have a directional fabric. So again, a direction fabric might be a print that you know has balloons and you wanna make sure that on every single pattern piece, the balloons are floating to the air, not dropping to the ground. So you need to cut that print in a certain direction. This also applies to things like velvets and corduroys. Uh, and things with what's called a nap, which the way they have this sort of fuzzy raised pile to it will catch light differently depending on which grain, uh, uh, which way the length grain is facing upwards. So that kind of fuzzy napped pile has a grain of its own, kind of like a cat's hair has a, a grain of its own. You want to brush the cat toward the back it's quite annoyed and all the hair bunches up if you do it from back to front. Same thing with velvets and corduroys and things like that. And uh, because it has that sort of flow of the pile, it creates um, a different color when um, the length grain is um, either pointing up one way or reversed. So that would be called a directional fabric. So we have to cut all of the pattern pieces in the same direction when we do that. But you guys should know about that by now. All right, we have all of our parameters filled in, so let's do next. And it's just, this is sort of a summary. Um, yes, I want all my pattern pieces, and I want, I obviously want them aligned on the grain line. Duh, because we of course have to do the grain line. Now, um, this being a less sophisticated uh, program, it um, basically relies on you to go ahead and move the pattern pieces into place so this is my area let's say my fabric that's 44 from selvage to selvage and 72 inches um, uh, uh, long as dictated by my cutting table or uh, uh, preference or whatever and it basically relies on me to position all the pieces um, to see how I do it best to see how I, I like to cut them out best to see um, what I can really achieve in the smallest amount area. It does let me flip around my pattern pieces, so let's assume this is not directional or anything else, and I see, oh, but this is kind of coming on a little bit. I might be able to, let's like flip it around and maybe flip it this way, actually flip it this way again. Wait. Okay, whatever. It's not flipping it the way I particularly want it to, but I'm sure there is a way to do that. Anyhow, so um, we can flip it around, of course. I can't rotate it too much because I still want my length grains to uh, be in their position. And again, you might think, oh man, this is, this is quite tedious. Um, and it indeed it is. Um, and this is only one pattern piece. Imagine if I had, you know, an entire uh, uh, size run for a collection on here. It's very, very tedious. And not only is it tedious, it's very time consuming. And I'm never really 100% sure if I'm using the most efficient layout of the fabric possible, which is, of course, the main uh, reason we create markers. So these plans allow us to cut our fabric in the most efficient way possible, reducing the amount of fabric wasted and the amount of fabric needed, uh, keeping it to an absolute minimum. And this, of course, reduces our material costs for garments. Uh, and of course, uh, as we learned in the pricing section, 
Uh, fabric is the number one most extensive element that goes into our garments. We, of course, want to reduce and keep our fabric costs to an absolute minimum. Um, so the way we do this more efficiently is, of course, not to do it by hand. Now, small companies that can invest in a, either a marker program or marker services, which are often um, provided to fashion companies by third-party companies, um, what we do is, uh, you know, small companies will do it this way. Um, better or, or bigger companies or companies that really need to invest in um, markers done very, very well, very, very properly, will invest in um, either companies that will provide this service for them or softwares that can do this system for them um, and utilize what's called an algorithmic nesting program. Now, what this does is we set it up the same way. We enter in our pattern pieces just like I entered in my pattern pieces. We enter in our parameters just like I entered in my parameters. Information different like that. Of course, it would be more than just one pattern. It'd be one pattern in multiple different sizes and potentially even different garments and things like that. But once we set it in, um, instead of when I hit sort of, you know, um, simulate, instead of relying on me to try out and sort of figure out visually what works for my marker, um, it runs it through a computer program that basically goes through almost all different uh, positioning possibilities uh, and finds the most efficient one uh, possible. Um, uh, so it wastes the least amount of fabric and takes up the least amount of space um, absolutely possible. And obviously the computer programs are much better and more efficient than humans are at doing this. Um, so that is why most companies will opt uh, for an algorithmic nesting program to create their markers. Um, this is great for small companies or, um, you know, designers that are doing tiny runs or sample runs or uh, aren't really at the place where they can afford a, a proper marker software or a proper marker service provided to them by a third party. Um, so, you know, if this is where you're starting out, that's where you're starting out. But once you start to grow, one of the first things, uh, you know, I would at least suggest um, investing in is um, either the software itself to create the markers or a marker service um, that creates the markers for you. All right, so hopefully that makes markers uh, uh, make a little bit more sense to you. Um, and of course, before we cut anything, uh, this is what we do. now. Not every single run for every single designer is going to need a marker. Um, say you're a small designer doing a small sample run, you probably don't need a marker. Um, if you are a custom designer, so you're going to have many, many different sizes and things like that and really, really small runs, you might not need a marker. But the majority of fashion companies um, will need a marker or do uh, invest in markers um, by the time they at least get to bulk, if not for sample as well. All right, so let's just X out of there and we'll head on back here and continue. Okay, so let's, we say we have our marker, fantastic. So um, let's go on. Once we have our marker, we're ready to cut. So how do we cut? Well, there's lots of different, I'm sorry, we're not ready to cut <laughs> for one more other step. So before fabric is cut, it needs to be laid out neatly. And of course, we don't just rely on people to lay out the bolts of fabric. And of course, well, you know, we do have people help, but um, we utilize different machines. So this is a, uh, what looks like what he's doing is, is he's overseeing an automatic cut, uh, spreader, um, but there's, just like cutting, there's lots of different sort of equipment utilized to spread out the um, fabric. So what you can't see behind here is the bolt of fabric, um, and it is threaded through here, and this machine will lay it out, spread it out to the appropriate length, um, either fold or cut it when it gets to the end, and then come back the other way um, and spread it out. And you can see here it's, it's got many, many layers already. 
Um, and I have actually some video links at the end if you guys want to see any of this stuff in action. Um, I would uh, recommend uh, following those links. Um, I'd show them on the video, but there are other YouTube videos. So, I'd, I, and since I'm going to post this on YouTube, I don't want to get you know copyright infringement trouble or anything like that. So, just follow the links. I'll have them up on Blackboard too, because since this is a video, you won't be able to click the links. But um, uh, um, it's it's really interesting to see how this whole thing kind of goes, uh, process takes place, and. Um, if this is something that you're not aware about and, you know, maybe you had the misconception that, you know, everyone just sort of cut it out and scissors the way you do, um, it's, it's really an, an educational thing to, to, to realize how it's actually done. So this guy is, looks like an automatic spreader. So he'll, be, he'll sort of type in here how far it needs to go back, how many layers it needs, so on and so forth like that. Um, once the fabric has been laid out into its many, many layers, uh, one of the most basic ways to cut on an industrial scale is to use a rotary saw, like one of these guys. Um, they have their limitations. They can't go quite as thick. So these are typically used for smaller companies doing smaller runs of garments. Um, but they uh, 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 resemble any other type of uh, circular saw but they are especially made for cutting fabric. They're quite sharp uh, and, and typically handheld. And again, in the links in the end, I have people using uh, one of these as well. And here's an image of someone using them. So the slotted, this sort of base part is put on the actual table um, and it helps us keep our hands steady as it is. It, so we're not actually holding the weight of the saw. It's, it's, um, uh, here weighted on the table and we it's uh, kind of got this in, uh, uh, incline so the fabric uh, easily slides up this sort of base and gets fed through gets cut by the saw and works just like so uh, the main problem with the rotary saws for fabric is they're a little clumsy with very tight shapes. Um, as you can see, the sort of width of this whole cutting blade here, um, if you have a very tight, tight um, curve or detail, it's a little difficult to achieve. Uh, but for sort of wider curves and long straight lines, it does just fine. Um, it also has a little bit extra, uh, uh, it can only do so, such certain thicknesses. So if you have a super thick layer of fabric that you need, uh, or many, many layers of fabric that you need, you might need to upgrade a little bit. But if you only have, um, it looks like, I'm trying to see how many layers she has here, maybe about uh, 25 to 50 layers of fabric, uh, it's not so bad, it'll work just fine. Now, if you have more than that or uh, need a slightly more precise system, uh, larger orders will use uh, a machine with a straight knife cutting technique uh, that is capable of going through more layers of fabric. Uh, and this resembles a sort of standard table jigsaw. Um, and this is a, a very sort of basic uh, um, illustration of what this straight knife will look like. So this is sort of the engine that makes it go. Um, uh, and also it can go along here, doo -doo -doo -doo, so it can be moved. These things sort of swing around. So this thing is very mobile. So the handles here um, are meant uh, for the cutter to guide it, to guide this around the pattern. And then of course it can go here, it can pivot here, it can pivot here, it can pivot here. So you get a very uh, wide range of motion from it and the fabric is laid out here and the straight knife if itself just kind of goes through the fabric um, as needed. This is how one will look like in real life. So this guy is cutting, I'm trying to figure out what he's cutting here. Looks like, looks like he's cutting a shirt and jeans. Cause this looks like it might be a jean front this looks like it's probably a shirt so see this is a folded so this is a folded technique how this is fold still folded here so we still can uh, uh, create our on fold garments um, with an on fold line here uh, if we so need to so this is the folded type of uh, uh, fabric layout as opposed to a flat so 
So all the selvage edges are up here and all the folded edges are down here. And he's using again that straight layer and just see how thick that layer of fabric is. Um, so again, this is folded. So this is the layers of fabric are even twice as much as you can really tell here because this is a fold and indicates two layers of fabric instead of one. However, there are more uh, cutting techniques as well, more modern ones. Um, we have, uh, or technologists have been able to eliminate the cutter altogether. Uh, as a human, uh, I should say. So uh, in the area of more advanced cutting methods, um, there is a computerized cutting knife. So this uses the same sort of theory or technology or technique as the straight knife cutters, however, does not rely on a human person to cut. Uh, this complex machine automatically cuts the fabric using a computer to input the marker information. So this is a huge one. Um, it, it, I was sort of looking into these guys a little bit to do this. Um, uh, and this is you know, it's pretty much state of the art for this sort of thing. There's many different companies that create them. Um, this particular piece of machinery runs about $80,000, which actually is not that expensive for something um, as sophisticated as this. Um, uh, uh, basically we can see here, it not only will it cut the fabric with the head here, so here's this little guy here, kind of looks like Boba Fett or whatever, um, uh, has the saw and it will come out and um, you pretty much put in the marker here from the computer. Uh, the computer reads the marker information and tells uh, this uh, little head, the cutter head, to go around and cut all the little pieces of pattern. And not only that, is it probably has an automatic spreader built in, so you throw the bolt onto here at the end, and it will spread the fabric, uh, layering it as accordingly, and then once it's done spreading, it goes ahead and cuts. Um, a lot of times, you'll see this in the videos too, to keep the fabric in place, it needs to sort of clamp or shrink wrap a little bit before, just so it, the fabric stays in place during cutting. Here's another model of one of those. This one's made by Gerber. Um, and it has a little blurb about it that I found on its like little website or um, wherever. Um, or no, oh, text to learn a blog spot. This was actually interesting. They had some good um, uh, information on new technologies used in the fashion industry for cutting. So this machine, it's a computerized cutting knife and its move movement is controlled um, by a computer. Ah, duh. Uh, the cutting table is used for a computer controlled straight knife cutting machine. Bah, bah, bah. It is different than normal cutting, uh, a normal cutting table uh, because of course we do not need um, people to do it. Uh, the tabletop is covered with a bed of nylon bristles. So that indicates this area in here, this whole tabletop. Uh, the nylon bristle bed is capable to support the fabric lay and also allows the straight knife to pass through and move around the nylon bristle. Hence the cutting of each and every ply of fabric in the lay is confirmed. Um, so again, it has like almost like a little pile of nylon that allows the knife to sink, sink in uh, deeply through, um, uh, cutting it um, perfectly down to that last layer of fabric, which of course we call ply. So, um, oh, let me go back just a second. Um, so when we are laying out the fabric, um, we have all those different layers, of course, and the different layers depend on, you know, how many garments we need cut, uh, so on and so forth. But every layer is called a ply in this instance. So um, just so you know, that's what they're talking about. Um, because, of course, plied fabric has a different meaning. Um, but in this instance, when we're talking specifically about spreading fabric for cutting, every layer is called a ply. Um, so if you say how many plies um, are, do you need laid out, um, uh, and that would be specified for your marker as well. So your marker is how many plies um, will be cut, and again, that will determine, be determined by how many garments you actually need. Um, bah, bah, bah. Okay, the nylon bristle bed also allows air suction through the bed to make it lay compressed by vacuum pressure. So in this instance, we don't need to clamp or shrink wrap or anything with our fabric because it has these sort of little uh, vacuum suction cups or whatever or, or valves that are happening right here that suction the uh, fabric down to the bed to hold it into place while it gets cut. Pretty nifty. 
I don't know, I didn't see how much this was costing, but I'm going to guess with the Gerber. The, so this Gerber probably has its own marker system as well. I don't know if a lot of these, you know, you're paying this much money, they may as well come with their own marker software, you would think. Um, so, you know, um, even if uh, a lot of times designers don't have their own markers, um, that'll be an additional service provided by whoever they get the cutting from. Okay, now um, one of the other really advanced methods for cut, cutting is to um, leave out the blade, leave out the person, and use a uh, high-powered automated cutting system. This is where a hot laser cuts through fabric with extreme precision. Um, and I'm talking super extreme precision. So laser cutting methods um, not only are used for cutting the actual garment pieces out in a similar way as uh, that automated, you know, straight knife system. Um, again, the fabric is laid out and the laser cuts through fabric pieces, um, but it can also create super intricate lace-like designs in certain fabrics and I have some examples here. Um, and this technology used used quite a bit. It's, it's fairly recent. Um, but again, has been adopted by many, many fashion designers, again, to create these just gorgeous, again, very intricate, very precise designs, um, very quick and easily. Um, and you really see this everywhere. Um, and if you, you know, if you hadn't noticed it before, what, you know, these laser cuts are, you'll notice it now after this, because you really see this in stores everywhere. Little laser cut designs, anything with like holes in it, um, in, a, in a generally precise um, or intricate manner, were typically created using a laser cut system. Now, laser cuts are typically made um, with either, uh, you can make it with wool, but typically with uh, synthetics. This is because, so we know synthetics are typically plastic. Uh, so when the laser cut system works, what happens, that laser is very, very hot. And it, it essentially burns through the fabric. But as it burns through the fabric, since the synthetic fabrics are kind of plastic, they melt just a little bit. And that just a little bit is enough to sort of melt the different yarns together so it prevents the fabric from fraying. Um, again, another huge advantage to laser cutting over the other methods because the other methods do not prevent further fraying of the fabric. All right, so um, how do we organize our cutting other than our markers? Uh, well, we have a couple documents um, that we typically use as fashion designers just to help organize what we do when we need uh, anything cut. Uh, the first is a cutting ticket, and cutting tickets are fairly simple. Um, so whichever way a garment is going to be cut, with any one of those methods, a cutting ticket is typically made for each garment. Uh, this form will help develop either the marker use uh, or help guide the cutter. It lists how many garments will be needed to be cut and what sizes and colorways will be needed. So here we have a little bit of a sample from Human B, which is, um, uh, we've sent some alumni over there and we've had lots of interns, so hooray for them. Um, what we do is we have, you know, general information about uh, the garment. Um, so we have a cut number. So that's sort of the order to be cut. So every, this would be placed, let's say, on a marker or for a garment to be cut or part of a, a bulk or sample production. Um, uh, so that has its own number for cutting. Um, it's just basically an order number. We have the style number of the garment, date, when it gets submitted, when it's due. So they're not giving a lot of time for this. We got three days to do it. Actually three, I thought that was a six at first, so one day. Um, description of the garment, season, so on and so forth. This will have the, the, you know, the contact and um, company information for the cutter and for the contractor. The contractor would be the sewer, the person sewing it. A lot of times the cutter and sewer are the same people in the same garment factory, so this would look the same. Sometimes they're different. Um, all just depends on who you're working with. Um, so let's get down to the meat of it. Again, it's fairly simple. It says um, what are the fabrics um, or colorways. Um, okay, so fabrics. Uh, uh, that are going to be used. And we have our, our fabrics here, a silk charmeuse and a silk chiffon. 
Um, here we have the colorways. We have black, red, and uh, black and white polka dot. The, all this is going to be done in um, these three colorways. And it's listing out how many of each of these colorways and of what style need to be done. So if we just run down the list, we have a petite. Um, five black petites are going to be made. Uh, four red petites are going to be made. Two polka dots are going to be made out of petite. Um, I'm not going to do every one, so let me just jump. Here we can see the middling sizes are, have the greatest quantities. Um, as I was describing, this is most common to be seen because most of us are kind of just average and in the middle. Um, so we typically make more um, middling sizes than we do extra larges or petites or something like that, as you can see. Um, uh, it sort of fades in and out like that, and that just sort of is representative of that general curve of body types that are, you know, existing. Um, so let's go to medium. We got 15 blacks, 12 reds, and 6 polka dots going on. And we basically just total up. These are the total for each fabric way. Uh, this is the total for each size. And then this is the grand total. So this is going to be a run of 132 garments. Fairly small. Um, and it's saying please leave three yards of uh, extra for each fabric. Um, that's just a cutting instructor. Maybe they want it to be sent back to keep for swatching or make a, another garment out of it or probably just for swatching and labeling and things like that. So they're sending all their fabric over there, but they want them to just leave three yards extra if possible and send it back to the company again for filing or swatching or whatever. Um, so well, there we go. There's our cutting ticket. They're missing a swat. So t um, this is actually a little atypical, I will say. So um, uh, I'm going to go over a little bit more of a normal cutting ticket. This is a fairly normal cutting ticket. But um, uh, when we do ours, I have uh, areas for swatches for each fabric, um, which is incredibly common. Um, so of course, you know, black charmeuse, that's fine. But um, just to make it foolproof, we typically attach swatches of each fabric um, to each one, just in case you have a few uh, silk chiffon polka dots. You know, you want to be made out of the exact right one. All right, in addition to our cutting tickets, we usually have a cutter's must. And a cutter's must is related to um, a cutting ticket that has slightly different information on it. Uh, a cutter's must basically lists out all the cutting information for each piece of a pattern. So um, when we talk about making patterns, and we've done this, you know, we've made, you've made and labeled patterns in almost all of your classes, you know that one of the things that absolutely must be on every pattern piece is the cutting information for a pattern piece. And that tells um, whoever is sewing or cutting uh, how many pieces must be cut of that pattern piece and of what uh, fabric does it need to be cut out of? And this basically just summarizes the entire pattern uh, for the garment, um, uh, summarizes the cutting info for the whole pattern of a specific garment. So um, let's just take a look at this real quick. We have a little bit of a collared shirt. Um, these are all the pieces that are going to be cut out of the self or main fabric. So we have uh, two pieces of the front, that would be one, two pieces there, back, one piece of the back. Uh, yoke, that's this piece right up here. It says two because the yokes are always doubled up. Uh, sleeve, of course we have two sleeves. Uh, continuous lap. I'm actually not sure what the continuous lap is. I'll let me go through everything else and I'll come up with something probable. We have the collar, which is the top part of the collar there. We have the under collar, which is the collar stand. Um, we have self B, okay? So um, self B would be a contrasting fabric. So uh, we have the cuff, of course. So the cuff is going to be made out of a different type of fabric. Uh, the collar band, oh, here we go. So no, okay, so um, collar and under collar. So that is both the top collar, sorry. Um, it's just a, um, sometimes, and you see, actually, this is much more common for jackets and things, but they might be doing it for this. But they might do the top layer on length grain and the bottom one on uh, bias or something like that. It helps the way the collar falls. So that might be an instance here. So we have a, a, a two 
pretty much the same pattern piece, but actually sort of a different grain. Um, and that would be indicated on the pattern piece itself. Um, self B, of course, there's a contrasting, so our cuffs are going to be contrasting. Collar band, so that is the collar stand, um, the little part underneath that makes the rest of the collar stand up. Uh, and the left front plackets. I mean, these are the button plackets here. Still don't know what that continuous lap is. Can't even come up with anything good. Anyhow. Now here we have, so we have our contrasting fabric, our regular fabric, and we also have um, our fusible. So we're going to get a, an interfacing piece. Remember, fusible and interfacing are the same thing. Fusible is just a type of interfacing. Um, we have the cuffs, of course, the collar band, uh, the collar. Uh, and that these are for the button placket pieces here. Of course, we've got two of them, one for the right, one for the left. Uh, this is indicating what needs to be marked. So we need um, our buttonholes marked on our cuffs and also down our front button placket. Uh, this is giving us a seam allowance guide. So 3 8 inch for all these guys, cuffs, collar, collar band plackets. Uh, oh, they made a typo. Um, center front, shame on you, Brooks Brothers. Um, uh, neckline, blah, 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 half inch for everything else. Um, it's reading over the trimmings again. Um, this might help. So once patterns um, are cut, they need to be sort of all the pattern pieces need to be collected together with all the materials needed for one garment. So you might be saying, what the heck is this needed for? So some person has to take all of those, you know, if you've got a hundred layers of fabric that you just cut, you have hundreds of different pieces for this. Um, what you have to do now is using that layer, layer, layer of fabric, um, take out two fronts, one back, two yokes, two sleeves, blah, blah, blah. Once you have all that, add the trimmings, um, so on and so forth, and then pass it along to your um, sewers. Uh, just a little short description of the uh, garment itself, um, and again, the trimmings down here. Now here's some uh, just additional information. I'll post these. These uh, you, you know you can't can't actually click on these, so don't try. <laughs> but I will I will uh, post links uh, that you can't click on uh, on Blackboard. But if you want to just um, uh, you know type in these links, um, uh, go right ahead. Um, but again, I'll have them. And again, they're just very interesting. So this is just a website talking about um, cutting uh, fabric for production versus sampling, so bulk, that would be bulk versus sample. Um, just sort of has a good look at um, cutting techniques and you know what we do in the industry to cut fabric. Um, and then the rest of these are just videos that show a lot of the machinery uh, that I highlighted in this video in action, which is pretty neat. So um, how manual spreaders work, how automatic spreaders uh, work, uh, laying, this is laying and cutting with a uh, manual straight knife uh, um, technique, um, how these computerized cutters work. Uh, this, is a, this one is a rather lar long video, but you can kind of, um, you know, fast forward through it to, as you kind of get it. But it's, it's very relaxing, has this nice sort of classical music put over it. And then of course laser cutting, and this is sort of um, uh, an industrial industrial promo video, someone trying to get you to buy their laser cutter, so it's, you know, talks about all the different functions and things like that, which is pretty neat. Um, so, you know, if you've got a little extra time or whatever else, I would I highly recommend just sort of watching some of these videos, especially if you are not familiar with cutting uh, techniques within the industry. It is, you know, uh, an area that is pretty interesting and it's, it's constantly evolving. Um, we're finding new and better methods to do things, you know, as you can see, we can, you know, go um, sort of back in time with the, you know, the actual manual saws and how, where we've come uh, with the computerized automated cutting and things like that. Um, you know, sooner or later, we're going to automize the whole, the whole production. We've automized the cutting. Uh, we have not yet gained the ability to automize the sewing, but um, I could see that that is, it's, it's, it's coming. Um, anyways, so what I want to do is I just want to, that concludes sort of the video, um, but we have an assignment related to this as normal, so let's just take a look at the assignment. It's going to be due next week um, on the 4th, May the 4th, May the 4th be with you. Um, so the objective is pretty much just special documents and considerations must be filled out and taken before fabric can be cut for either sample runs or bulk productions. 
Uh, this assignment will require you to become a bit more familiar with two of the most basic types of cutting documentation common in the fashion industry, cutting tickets and a uh, cutter's must. Um, so you're going to either design or find a garment online to do this. So you're going to basically you're going to fill out a cutting ticket and a cutter's must based on a garment you find online or that you design. So just depending on what you want to do, how much effort you want to put into it, um, so on and so forth. So both documents have a fillable versions posted on Blackboard. Um, you can find them there. Uh, and for more guidance on how to do this, please watch the video that you're watching right now. Uh, so <laughs> uh, requirements, find or design a garment with at least three colorways, okay? And this is important again because uh, our cutter cutting ticket um, will have areas for different colorways and you know, Cutting tickets are so simple anyways, um, you may as well do it for three colorways, you know, at least. Uh, sometimes there's many, many colorways. Sometimes there's like 10 different colorways for we do for a garment. It just depends. Uh, use this garment to fill out a cutter's must and use this garment to fill out a cutting ticket. Note, if you are having trouble um, filling out the documents, uh, please download Adobe Reader. So a lot of you guys are kind of copying them. and. Look at any way you get the documents filled, I have no problem with it. You want to print it out, fill it out by hand, and send me a picture, fine. You want to open it in Word and use Word to fill it out, fine. Um, but, you know, I'm uh, trying to make it as easy for you to be able to fill out the contents of these documents. So, um, you know, I'm creating these fillable PDFs. Um, and you are able to fill them in rather easily using Adobe Reader. It's an absolutely free download uh, that will allow you to fill it in and save it and send it back to me, which I'm just going to assume is the easiest way. Uh, but again, you don't have to do it this way if you can't get it to work or you like doing it the other ways. I, I really don't care just as long as you get it in. You're able to fill it out either by hand or on the computer and get it back to me. Don't care. Um, but again, I'm just trying to make it easy for you guys. Okay, so let's take a look at the documents and how we fill them out. So what I'm going to do is find my garment, and I already have. I found this lovely garment here with three colorways. Doo -doo -doo. We have a blue, kind of looks purple to me, but whatever, um, and a teal. They call it green, but I'm not calling that green. That's obviously teal. So, um, ooh, that's a little pink. Frill. Oh, that's so cute. Okay, so basically what I, uh, I'm going to use this garment as uh, my example. I'm not going to design one. Again, uh, just you can do that too, or you can design it as well. Just make sure it has three um, colorways, okay? So um, let's start out. Let's start out with our cutting ticket. So um, let me open it up. Sorry, I should have it open already. Let's do cutting ticket, but it's a fillable cutting ticket. You know what? Actually, I so I'm gonna uh, post my PDF here, but I'm also gonna post um, an Excel version because I've entered in formulas for uh, here, so you don't have to add it up. So, um, so here we go. Um, again, you're pretty much just going to put this in. So cut number, you're going to just make something up. So fine. Season. Let's look to the future. Style number, of course, just make something up. Date. Yeah, what, whatever we'll do. Again, this stuff doesn't really matter. Due date, that would be when it would be cut by, so let's let's give them a little while. Um, give them to the first. Um, garment description, you can just pull that from here, so it's a tunic, so uh, sheer uh, tunic with, looks like it has like a little lining uh, attached to it, a little lining dress attached to it, so it has this sort of deep v-neck, so let's do that. Do cutter, Mr. Cutman, blah, 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 you know, 
one, two, three, Carter's Lane. And again, you're just gonna make this up because I'm assuming that you guys don't have a cutter or contractor in your Rolodex yet. Uh, contractor, Mr. Soman. One, two, three, sewers. Sewers name. Okay. Um, swatches. So here what I have, um, I have areas to put in something. Should be able to put it, uh, pull it up. So I, what I have here is I really just sort of pulled a few uh, pictures I'm going to need for this demo. Um, so the swatches, we have one colorway. I'm going to see if I can just sort of plop it in there and I can. Um, now it looks like these guys. So I'm going to go back to here. So it actually has two fabrics. It has sort of sheer fabric here and it has a solid fabric that is used to line like uh, this placket for the deep V, this area in here, as well as this sort of lining in here and, and creates a little skirt. So it has this sort of under layer, this sort of spaghetti strapped under layer lining. Uh, so this is using two different fabrics. Okay, so this is actually a fairly complicated example. You don't have to do something quite as, as complicated, um, but if you want to. And so this is gonna be the first colorway. So we have um, a white and turquoise. We have a, come on now, purple and purple. No, it said blue, but I don't think it looks that blue. And we have the orange way, which also uses this guy. So I'm just gonna copy and paste. Okay, fantastic. And um, you're basically just gonna make up how whatever run this is gonna go, but again, make it make sense. So the middling sizes should be most. So let's make a run of, uh, let's say 15 garments here, um, 20 garments here, 25 garments here, 20 garments here, and 15 garments here. So again, that is showing you the kind of basic arc that we typically see. Most people are average, so we're gonna make more mediums than anything else. Um, teal is uh, a nice color. Uh, purple is a great color. Um, uh, I, it's my personal, I like, this is my personal favorite colorway. So um, let's assume that that's gonna be more popular and cut more out of it. Um, I'm actually, so if you actually look on the website, the display version is the orange, um, which I'm assuming, so they, they start with this one, and typically the display one is the one they think is gonna be the most popular and most attractive to people. So given that, um, I'm gonna assume that due to their sort of trend research or whatever, they are planning on cutting or have cut more of this dress than any other. So let's apply that in our numbers. Okay. So now we have a run, we're cutting um, five sizes from extra small to extra large. Um, we're gonna cut a total of 95 teal dresses, a total of 145 purple dresses, and a total of 170 uh, orange dresses. And then of course this will tally up. So we're um, creating a total of 70 extra small, 85 small, 100 medium, 85 um, large and 70 extra large. Okay, and then just down here, I'm going to repeat all the stuff uh, I put in above. So you can actually, if you do open up the Excel version, you can just go ahead and once you fill that in, uh, copy and paste down here. Um, and then of course we want an illustration of each garment way um, and any sort of special instructions. So let's just plop, plop, plop. And of course we can resize them to 
outfit. They're not very high quality, but it doesn't really matter. And we got you. I don't know if I like that little pink on the bottom. I'd like it better if it was white. What do you guys think? Okay, so any special instructions or anything? Um, I don't know what the special instructions would be. Um, you can leave it blank if it doesn't seem that important. Um, but this is pretty much it. That's all you would need for your cutting ticket. Again, it's just listing out how many sizes and of what fabric way you need. Oh, the other thing I would do is uh, just go ahead and put in my fabric dif uh, uh, description. So um, self A, because again, we have two. Um, what I hate, what I hate about these online stores is they don't tell you anything. So, you know, there's all these court cases that you have to have the fabric type, the place of manufacturing, blah, 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 blah. Where do you find it? You don't find it anywhere. Where was it made? It tells me nowhere where it was made. Um, of course, it's, it's labeled, um, and the idea is you'd go to the store and see it on the label where it's made, but again, I can't. So where was it made? Where was it made? I want to know. Um, what's it made out of? Viscose? Everything? Everything was made out of viscose? See, there's never, there's never enough information online. I know it's the way of the future, but you need to start labeling their information. But again, that's the thing. That's me. No one really, no one, no one normal cares about where it was made, I guess. Um, so we're just going to say sheer viscose chiffon, sheer, Ooh, let's, um, let's wrap this text, so you might have to do this too, or I'll, I'll do this before I post it actually because I haven't posted it yet, uh, we just want that to wrap, okie dokie, and I mean, um, we also have, oops, Self B, and let's just call it a viscose jersey. Um, oh, and I'd probably put in the uh, that, yeah, the colorway. Uh, and this is pretty much going to be the same, so I'm just going to copy paste. And instead of teal and white, this is purple, red and white. And this is a, gonna be purple. And down here, we'll just change that to orange. And there we go. So done, done ski, that's all you need to do. Um, very easy, very simple, very quick. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're gonna uh, to use the same garment to fill out our cutter's must. So let's go ahead and do that, um, just quickly. Cutter's must, fillable cutter's must. Okay, here we go. So here's what it's gonna look like. Um, this one I'm gonna post up. And we have uh, a place for the image of the garment. So uh, what I'm going to do is, oh, I took everything out of there. Don't save. Well, I'm just going to go back here. And you don't need all the colorways. I'm just going to, let's see, crop and drag this image in here. Oh, come on. Fine, I'll get it from the website. put it in there and you can size that. It's good enough. Okay, so um, same stuff as before. Your cut number should match what you put on your cutter's ticket. Your style number should match what you put on the uh, cutting ticket. Blah, blah, blah. Season, blah, blah, blah. Due date, due date, everything like that. Okay, that should all just follow the same thing as what you put on your cutting ticket. So I'm not going to do it again. Now what we want to do is I want to put out 
all the pattern pieces that are going to go here, okay? So let's just take a look. Um, oops, sorry, let's go back up here. And I want to take a look really closely. So if we see here, um, and there's lots of nice images uh, here, there is a sort of neckline uh, uh, placket right down here. You see that placket? I don't see any. Uh, yeah. It goes here. I don't see any seams, so it goes here and around. Probably if I look real close, let's see, there's probably, there's a shoulder seam right here. So there's one for the front and probably one for the back. Um, let's check that back. Yep, there's that one for the back. Um, and it's fairly loose. You see, it's a very loose garment. It doesn't um, uh, fit very tightly at all. And since we put jersey in the, in the uh, middle here on the underline here, we don't really need a closure, and apparently that's why it does not have a closure. I'm not seeing a closure. It might have something on the side, but um, again, no information for us. So um, just looking at the top up here, we have a, uh, let's say, a neckline placket for the front and back. We have a yoke. We have a sleeve, and we have a front and back bodice. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, put that in. So we're also going to, hmm, where'd this go? Oh, fine. Since you don't like me clicking and dragging, let's do this. I'm gonna copy that. Paste it onto my desktop. And I click here, browse, desktop. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let's do one, piece one, front, bodice, quantity, one. Now I'll double check, so that's. Um, No, two. So here's the waistline. So there's a one, two with this little inset in between. Okay. I'm going to fix that. Two. Back. Bodice. Let's check the back. Because I think it's one. One in the back. So the pattern pieces, I'm just listing one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. Each uh, pattern piece gets its own unique um, number. So we have uh, number three, let's do the yoke. Now the yoke is two, because again, it always gets double layered. Um, let's do that uh, neck front neckline pl placket. That was two. Actually, it's probably going to be four because it's probably going to be double layered. Back, neck, line, black it. And then let's do that too. Um, we have a sleeve. Of course, we need two of them. And, oop, okay. No, I thought I. But did two sixes, but I didn't. Uh, we've got a front skirt, which we need one. We need a back skirt, which we need one. Um, we have that little bit of a neck insert right here. So you see this guy right here, this little piece. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that's the a front neckline insert. And 
that's looking good for our, our, our main fabric. That would be our fabric A. Uh, so front, neck, insert. We need one of those. Now that's self A, but I also have that little white fabric, that white viscose. So uh, I'm going to go in and sell B and list what I need there. So as you can see, as we pop on back um, to a lot of these, what we have is we have the underneath garment here. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that this whole piece for the back is one. This whole piece for the front is one. We have uh, a piece that is lined here. So you can see, you can see how it changes from being um, sheer in some places to not. It's probably because it was lined by this white fabric. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, line this fabric with the white. We're going to line the yoke with the white. Um, and we're going to line this inset here with the white as well. So let's start with those. So our yoke piece needs this. Okay, that's number three. And we probably don't need to double it out because we have two layers here. We probably only need one layer of the uh, white fabric as a sort of backing fabric. Um, what else do we need? We need front and back neckline. So that is piece four and five. And we can just copy. So I'm to type everything out again. Come on. And then our back. And we need um, two for our front and one for our back. And what else do we need? We need that front neck insert, which is piece number nine. And we probably need just one of those. Um, now we need some new pieces. So piece number 10, let's go with front dress. Lining. It is like a lining piece. And back dress. Lining. And we need one and one. And there we go. We got all of our pattern pieces. Now, what is getting interfacing? Um, I'm going to say that the neck uh, plackets are going to need, or the neck. Yeah, the neckline plackets are going to need interfacing. So what we're going to do is, let's do that again. That's piece four and piece five. And this one we're going to need two. And this one we're going to need one. Okie dokie. Um, so that's all the interfacing we need. Um, marks. Uh, I don't know. Let's say shirring around waist. Why not? Uh, trims. Um, we have a spaghetti strap. Ooh, there we go. Straps for lining where they're going to attach, so on and so forth. Spaghetti straps for um, lining. And seam allowances, let's say um, we have a larger hem allowance uh, of, let's say, one inch um, neck. Let's do quarter inch. And let's do half inch everywhere else. And here we have our little swatches, swatch area, um, where I pull in the swatches, uh, all the different swatches for this. Um, actually, you know what? Uh, so this is fine for this. I just had a thought for the other one, though. So that's basically what we do and how we fill it out. So hopefully that was helpful. And again, this is a fairly complicated one. So um, I just wanted to do that just, you know, pick something so you wouldn't have any questions when you got to yours, depending on how complicated you made or decided to do for you. 
Um, one other thing that I kind of want to mention uh, when I go back here. So I said, what would be the, uh, I couldn't think of any additional instructions. Um, however, or special instructions. However, if we notice on this and this, that this is actually not a trim down here. This is part of the fabric has a printed border on it. Um, it's not a separate piece um, sewn on. And this obviously needs to be cut this way. So this was a perfect example. It's actually one of the reasons I even chose this garment um, uh, to put in your special instructions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So for uh, purple and teal colorways, cut, so border of print falls along the hemline as seen in sketch because we have the little sketches right there okay well let's wrap the text here sorry let's format that so i'm, I'm also <laughs> editing out your the problems do that you might encounter by doing this. Oops, no, I didn't want to do that. Go here, I want to go here, and I want to go here, okay. And actually, let's put this in the center. Okay, and there we go. So there's your cutting ticket, there's your cutter's must, that's how you do it. Um, hopefully you're now an expert on all things about cutting fabric. Um, and I hope that uh, um, at least this opened uh, your eyes up a little bit to some of the different ways of cutting in the industry, especially if you were not familiar with them. Um, it's, it's actually pretty interesting and pretty fun. Um, and again, take a look at those links for those videos if you want uh, an additional information on how some of these cutting systems work. Um, that's all for now. Bye-bye, and I'll see you next week. Bye.